Bruce, I want to know what consciousness is. So I talk to philosophers, I talk to neuroscientists, even physicists. Everybody's weighing in on it. Maybe I'm going in the wrong direction. Maybe we should start really basic. Maybe I should talk to children. Uh, you talk to children. You do research on children. What can we learn about consciousness from children? You know, that's a really good point. We talk about consciousness usually as adults, and we make the assumptions that children are just little adults, but that's never really been true. Mm. And so I think in the work I do, we try to look at the emerging mind, but obviously consciousness is part of the mind, I and mean, that's what we're most familiar with. What is consciousness? It's just a really elusive thing. We can recognize consciousness, but describing it adequately, that's where all the problems start to arise. I suspect that if you really had a great description of what consciousness is, you've almost partly answered what it is in terms of how it works. But with kids, you see this, we see them behaving and we, we infer they've got minds and we're trying to interest, we're trying to put ourselves in their positions. But you can obviously never really know what someone else is thinking, which of course is one of the big problems of consciousness is subjectivity. Sure. sure. So, I mean, tra Trace, uh, as a child begins to develop, what are the kinds of signs that you can see that reflect consciousness that gives us a sense that there's something developing there? Right. So there are different types of consciousness. There's a consciousness in the moment. Okay. That's the experience you're having right now as you're listening to me. And that's a moment in time. It's fragmentary. It only lasts for a couple of seconds and then it fades. Okay. Unless you really, really actively try to rehearse it in your mind and then it becomes a memory. So unless it's actually stored as a memory, it will just fade into oblivion. So that's the, the momentary consciousness. And I think that every, you know, and with a brain must have that to some extent. That's what we would call sensation and perception. And I think that's there from the beginning. But if I ask you to reflect upon things and bring into consciousness experiences, then that's drawing upon your personal history. Now, I don't really think it's plausible that a very young infant can have much of a personal history. That must be an emerging property. And for example, if I ask you to think about, you know, tell me about yourself, um, you can you can relate facts about your history, but a child doesn't do that. In fact, very few children have any memory before their second birthday. Mm. And that's an interesting phenomenon. We call it infantile amnesia, inability to kind of recall these early events. But well, most people only can think back till where they're three or four years old with the first memory. I can yeah. see myself maybe at three, three and a half in one scene, but that's it. Uh, indeed, and the things that you do have are fragmented kind of uh, sensory events that don't really make a lot of sense. But from about three years onwards, then you've got more little bits of script about things that happened in events. Now, of course, there are always going to be people who have or claim to have earlier memories, and there will be others who have some typically a very emotional memory because these mm. seem to get log lodged much further in memory. But I think you need to have a sense of self. Okay, I think you need to have a sense of who you are as a, as a protagonist, as a character, in order to weave together all these, these events into a meaningful story. You made the claim that even infants can have sensations, this first element of so-called consciousness. Yeah. How, how do you know that? Well, in the way that they respond, we can do experiments to see whether they habituate. That's this behavioral response that if you're exposed to a stimulus, you initially show this alerting reaction to it. But if you repeat the exposure, then your behavior eventually just sort of flattens out. Mm -hmm. So this is a way that you're actually learning things. And so we, we've got all the behavioral evidence that they're showing a typical profile. What would an experiment look like? Oh, it could be something simply like responding to a visual picture and how much time they spend looking at it or how they respond to a sound. Anything which is a sensory event will cause this immediate uh, alerting response that eventually declines. In fact, some of the really early work of memory was done with simple alerting with uh, you know, sea slugs, which is Eric Kandel's mm -hmm. work. And we know actually at the neural level where that memory is being encoded as a trans. And you can see that in infants. Well, a we similar... don't actually do single cell recordings no, with infants right. for, for good right. reasons. Right. But of course, it's all based on the animal work. It tells us where in the brain and how in the neural But you system. see behavioral in Oh, in sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, babies are learning actually before they're born. You can show learning in a, <coughs> well. in a, in a fetus. So it it's, uh, you know, it's a ubiquitous type of behavior. Mm. Um, and of course, actually, their memories can be quite surprisingly long. So studies have shown that babies, uh, if they're trained to, for example, kick a mobile, if you tie a, a little ribbon to their foot and then you tie it to an interesting mobile and every time they kick, the mobile moves, then eventually they learn that uh, this, this behavior produces an outcome. Uh, and now you can send them home, and bring them back three months later, and if you put them in the same context, then they'll immediately remember and start mm. kicking again. Mm. So they can have memories which form over, over months. So it's not that they live in the here and now only, 
But the memories they do have are these sort of sensory behavioral memories. But this notion of consciousness of who am I, where am I going, what do I do, these are obviously much more elaborated sort of notions of self and identity and consciousness which have to be But most people, when they talk about consciousness, and when I think about it, and we worry about it, and we struggle with it, it's always as an adult in its fully formed way, yeah. and we're trying to figure out how this happens. Yeah. But if we think about it maybe as you've done, and developmentally, mm. and you see these pieces coming together, maybe it's less mysterious. That's right. And of course, the way that you interpret things, of course, depends on the way that you see the world. Now, a child of two or three years of age, typically has a very egocentric view of the world. They don't have a very elaborate notion of other people's perspectives. So if, if I was to ask you to tell me about an event that happened, you say, well, I did this, they did that, I thought this, and she thought that. So you've, you've already got a very elaborated, kind of sophisticated notion of other people's states of mind. So if you didn't have all that machinery in place, the way that you conceive the world would influence the way of what you remembered. So it must be changing because we know that children don't perceive the, the world in the same way as adults. And, and uh, when do you see those kinds of changes? I mean, what's an example of a, of, of a description of, of, of an event at one age and another age and you see the difference? Oh, well, for example, there is a phenomenon called theory of mind. You know, it could be right. the case that uh, if, you, if you lack a theory of mind, then you don't have the capability to take another person's perspective, their mental perspective. You so, hide by putting your hands over your eyes. That's right. Or you just assume everyone just knows the same things that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who's ever you know, talked to a two or two, two and a half year old, they have this kind of very egocentric view of the mm -hmm. world. Now, around about three to four years of age, there's this very marked transition where children start to understand that other people have different mental states. They, they acquire this theory of mind. Now, with that kind of a sudden transition, you can understand what other people are thinking, that they may have a false belief. They may uh, think something is true, but you know it's not. Uh, and then, of course, if you can read someone else's mind, theory of mind, then you can manipulate them and you can anticipate what they might do mm, next. Mm. So if you think about it, it's a really sophisticated ability mm. because it allows you to see someone else's perspective, put yourself in their shoes. And so that will affect the way that you interact with people all the time. And without that, then that's a different experience. So, for example, individuals with autism will not necessarily have a very sophisticated theory of mind. They'll right, have a real right. problem trying to understand someone else's My theory. granddaughter recently, I heard her say that was a joke. And I went over and said, a joke? I, I, don't, I don't know. What is a joke? I, I, I right. don't understand that. And she said, well, a joke is when you say something that you know is not true. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but of course, there are some people who lack the same degree of sophistication. You know, the, uh, we, we've talked about autism, but you don't have to have an atypical condition such as that. Some people are just not very good at, at you know, putting themselves in other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a skill that's partly so, so if we look at the full-blown consciousness that we have as adults, how many of the components of it, the things that make it up, can we trace back specifically to those things that you can see developing in children? Right, so I think the answer to that question is to understand that the way that you uh, experience consciousness is that you interpret it as well. So there is a phenomenology, there is the perceptions and so forth, but clearly uh, how you understand a situation will affect the conscious appreciation of that situation. So I think that's in the major part of what consciousness is, the cognition, the way to know what's going on.